Oh, people still read books. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, Wade. Oh my God, this is like a family reunion. My actual brother. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, fuck me. I want to tell this story again because it will never cease to amaze me that this moment is happening my whole reading life, which is basically since I was, I don't know, four seconds old. I uh, have come to the Strand and always said to anyone that would listen, the day that I walk into the Strand bookstore and see my book on the shelf, a book that I have written long before this was a glimmer in my I, uh, I'm that happy, so now I'm going to get hit by a bus. <laughs> That's all for what. Um, yeah, uh, shit, where do I even begin? I don't know. This book, um, yeah, there was never a time when I was not writing this book. I think I started writing this book when I was born. Um, I think my parents started writing this book before I was born, um, and I... I'm kind of freaking out right now, and freaking out is not something that is natural for me. Um, but it's just that big of a thing. You know, sometimes you work on things and they mean so much, and you birth them and you give them forth, and the only thing you can do is kind of push your head down and just go, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, because it means so much to you. You just hope that a little bit of that trickles out into the world. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to read a chapter to you of this behemoth that you can also use as a weapon when you're done reading it. Um, and then we'll do like a little Q&A sesh if you guys, but you, you, we can also just espouse your thoughts. You don't need to ask me things if you don't want to. Oh, that's good enough. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing a reading at the Strand. Wow. I just met the owner in the back room and I like bowed down next to her desk and was like, you don't understand, you run Mecca. And she's like, oh. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this chapter is called Zach. It's chapter 12 and it takes place at PS3, which was my elementary school, um, which is on Hudson between Christopher and Grove in September of 1993. So I was eight. Whew. Third grade is gonna rule. I know all my classmates, and we had Karen last year, so I know how to stay under her radar. It's rare that you get the same teacher twice in a row, but through an elementary school version of litigating the administrative office, a bunch of us pulled it off. I'm pretty clear on where my place is in the social ecosystem. I'm a weirdo loner kid who everyone is pretty confident is a boy, but they aren't sure. I'm not one of the cool kids by any means, but as long as I don't push my luck, I'm chill with everyone. The nerds don't mind me, and so far I've escaped any real brutality by generally being nice. There's something about being an enigma that earns you a certain holiness. It's easier to leave me alone than to tease me and have to dissect what the hell is actually going on in my underwear. Ma is gripping my hand, trying to pull me along because we're late, but I'm intent on leapfrogging every fire hydrant we pass. At quarter to eight, it's a long trek from the Bowery to Hudson Street basically from one side of sleepy Manhattan to the other, and it gets boring. From our place to Sixth Avenue, it's a long stretch of nada. At six, the homeless people start to appear, and occasional drag queens still tottering around from last night, they're entertaining to look at. Just south of Third Street is a bus stop, and I make sure to always pass between the stop and the lamppost directly in front of it. It's an essential ritual that will dictate the course of the whole day. If I don't pass between them, it won't go well. We turn up bleaker from Carmine Street, then it's a row of Italian bakeries, bread shops, and a record store. My stomach gurgles at the smell of fresh bread, and every day I pull my mom into Gino's for a hot loaf of semolina. I like how it's sweet, and I can scrounge my own 35 cents to buy it. A bar sits on the corner of Bleecker and 7th Avenue that has a giant plastic yellow cab outside of it, and a massive margarita glass hanging over the door. I use this as a landmark. When we pass the cocktail, we're in the home stretch, five minutes to school. Two blocks up, we make a left on Christopher. I like this street because it's quaint and beautiful, overhung with branches and lined with brownstones. It serves as a reminder of all the lives that we don't live. Quiet, calm, sweet, stable. Words I didn't even know were supposed to be associated with how you live your life. There are no bars here, no junkies, no blaring, no cars blaring bachata. Only prim gay men taking their dogs for an early morning walk who smile and wave. 
These guys pick up their dog's shit with manicured fingers and sandwich bags. Public school three hulks on the corner. The building takes up the better part of a city block. At 11.30, shrieking and laughter explodes from within, evidence of several hundred children unleashing pent-up fervor, but right now the block is quiet. Everyone is still too sleepy to make a ruckus. Ma takes me to the top of the stairwell. She checks me in with the security guard and I shoo away through the gym on my own. I pull off a corner of the semolina loaf and cram it in my mouth as I slowly climb the stairs. I don't care about being late, we're late for everything. A sense of urgency has not been instilled in me about lateness, I don't even register it as a problem. My world operates on my time because that's the only time that exists in my head. It's the third day of the new year and I might as well not set up any false expectations. One strap of my backpack dangles down over my elbow as I amble up the steps, leaning against the wall as I go. I'm so sleepy. Last night was a late one. The play I'm in had a performance and we went out with the cast afterward. My ma had a whine and got angry. It took us 45 minutes to walk home from Gramercy at midnight. When she tried to wake me up this morning, I took a swing at her face. She held me off, but I swung again. At first she was mad, but then she started laughing at my tenacity. She sat on the edge of the bed, holding my little fist, laughing and laughing and petting my head in that weird way she always does where she doesn't part her fingers and folds her hand like a ballerina who only bends at the waist. I finally cracked and started to giggle too. I took a swing at her shoulder out of embarrassment, but she pushed my hand away and kept laughing. These are the sweet moments, the times when I recognize what I see in other kids with their parents when they're buying chocolate lollipops or driving past us after school. These are the darling days when everything is all good and the beast is calm. The door to the second floor is heavy. My head is the height of an adult forearm, so I have to lean my entire body backward to swing it open. The hallway is quiet the way that it is only the first thing in the morning. I put little nibbles of bread in my mouth as I meander down toward Karen's classroom. Our class door is covered in colorful index cards with each of our names elaborately scrawled on them. When I push it open, everyone's sitting on the rug, 36 shining little faces from every corner of the city. Oops, there's that again. Uh, Karen is sitting on a tiny footstool under the blackboard, her big body folded over her knees, talking about what's gonna happen today. Karen is about 50, with a brush of graying hair, rectangular wire glasses, and a no bullshit kind of face. She wears oversized t-shirts and jeans with Birkenstock sandals, which combine to make her appear even more imposing. I like Karen so much, I don't know why. She scares the shit out of me, and getting her to smile is a hard-won victory, but I enjoy the challenge. That is not happening right now. She greets me with a hard glare over the top of her glasses. For a second, I think she's gonna say something, but her way of expressing annoyance is to ignore your existence, so she angles her body away and carries on talking. So what you're gonna do is you go into the hallway and line up double file. Find a buddy and stay online until I tell you to, hey, Andy, excuse me, Andy. Andy is a special needs kid. I don't know why he's in our class and not in special ed, but this is his second year in a row with Karen too. Dainty and hyperactive, he walks on his toes in a bouncy way that suits his aloofness. He has eyes like holes punched through paper with a pencil. They dart all over the place like he has 15,000 thoughts happening at once. He couldn't tell you what eight plus two was if you gave him a half hour to get back to you. He wears t-shirts tucked into his jeans and brags about how his family is Puerto Rican. He has a mullet and a rat tail. And he is prone to screaming freakouts and sometimes violence, but he's easy to fend off. He's the kind of kid you can hold off by the forehead and he'll keep swinging until he's so infuriated he starts to cry. He can't focus for very long, so Andy's name being yelled across the classroom is the basic soundtrack to the day. Right now, he's doing something on the carpet that he shouldn't with someone I don't know. As I hang my backpack on a bright yellow hook, I look at the new kid. Zach, don't distract Andy. Don't do anything while I'm talking, but listen to me. Got it? I guess his name is Zach. He's wearing a salmon-colored t-shirt and shorts. His hair is sandy blonde also with a mullet, and Jesus Christ, a rat tail. But he takes it one step further because his is wrapped in multicolored thread. He's muscular for an eight-year-old, and his eyes are bright, smart, but not particularly warm. He strikes me as angry. Got it, kid? 
Yeah, sorry. Before he's gotten the words out of his mouth, his look turns to me and he stares. Why is he looking at me? I'm trying to ignore it, but he's relentless. When I go on back, he's glaring. I turn my face back toward Karen. What the hell? But she glares at Zach. When we line up, you're walking at the front with me. Karen considers this a punishment, but last year I kind of liked it when she made me walk with her. I like talking to her better than anybody else anyway. Zach doesn't share the sentiment. He rolls his eyes and flops his chin down onto his chest. The two lines of children sneak from the stairwell halfway down the hall. It's nearly nine now and everyone is starting to wake up. 36 kids makes for a lot of chatter, jokes, and patty cake games, and a din that perpetually hovers in your shrieking splits the hall. I forgot we were going on a field trip today. It's a big one. We're going to the Brooklyn Aquarium. This kind of thing is usually reserved for the end of term summer trip, but we got rained out last year, and part of the joy of having Karen again is that she's making it up. The whole line is pushed up against the right wall of the hallway. I'm at the back, quietly holding hands with Magda, a tall, bug-eyed dork who favors interpretive dance and snap bracelets. I'm ambivalent about the aquarium, but I'm into the idea of leaving the building. Then I see Zach and his irritating rat tail to the left of everyone moving towards me. His eyes are locked on mine. I try to look elsewhere, but I know what's going to happen before it does. He marches up to me and stops a few inches from my face. Still holding Magda's hand, I look up into his dilated pupils and raise my eyebrows, wordlessly asking him what he wants. There's a slight hint of a smile before he rears back with his left hand and punches me square in the face. The full width of his fist connects with the center of my right cheek, sending an electrical shock into my eyes that instantly makes them tingle in water, prompting me to wonder how everything is so connected inside my head. He stands there looking at me. Magda is staring, horrified. His eyes are wild, alive, dancing with joy. He scans me for the impact of his attack, but I'm doing my best to look unfazed. With a little smile, he says, I bet you're gonna cry now, huh? I square off with him and say, no, no way. He laughs a little, spins around, and walks away. He reaches the front of the line at the same time as Karen, I know, and I know she has no idea what happened. If I ran to her now in front of everyone, I'd be a pussy, so I suck it up. Tears start streaming down my cheeks. Poor Magda is worried about me, but she has no idea what to do. She draws herself up to her full height and signals to her friends that something's wrong with me, but no one can be bothered. I just want to disappear. Salty eye water and snot run silently down my cheeks, and I'm trying to catch it all with my sleeve. I just don't understand. What did I do to him? Nothing. He doesn't even know me. Why me? There's a piercing feeling in my chest as it dawns on me that someone hates me. For no reason at all, but he hates me. I watch as Andy smiles at him and they clasp hands behind Karen. The painful sensation sharpens with the notion that everyone is in on something with this new jerk that I'm on the outside of. The aquarium sucks. I don't want to be near anyone or have to do any talking. I trail behind the class all day and I don't even bother to go near the gigantic tanks of sharks. We're a public school, so we can't see the dolphin show, but I don't care, I just wanna go home. I keep my head down and do my best to dangle my hair over the lump rapidly forming in my cheek. I can feel it bulging. The skin is hot and tender to the touch. The kid can throw a punch. As we make our way from tank to tank, I keep an eye on this prick, making sure to stay far away from him. An anger burns through me that makes me want to throw him in the shark tank or flip him upside down and stuff him in a trash can or maybe bash his nose in, but I don't think I'd win in a fist fight. His stocky neck tells me as much. At some point I notice that he's spending an odd amount of time with Barney, the other class oddball. Barney has absolutely no friends because Boney, Barney is a bona fide nerd. He wears glasses that are constantly slipping and dinosaur fanny packs and he has a watch that tells him when to pee. I sold that watch once last year because I thought it was stupid and to his detriment that he couldn't figure it out for himself. I thought he might be lying, but he pissed his pants. I felt bad and gave it back, apologized to him and his mother, and swore I would never mess with him again. For all his nerdiness, he has a super kind heart, and he forgave me the next day, offering me some of his lunch. Since then, we've been on tenuous good terms, but I've put in a lot of work making sure he knows I mean him no harm. Half an hour later, outside by the penguins, 
An arm goes around Barney's fat shoulder, and I pretend not to see. Zach leans in and says something to him, and they both turn to look at me. I roll my eyes and pull my chin into my neck because I think it makes it look thicker and tougher, and turn away. Barney is getting high off the thrill of having someone cool like him, and he's turning into a monster in front of me. He no longer looks at me with eyes glazed over by the rich fantasy world of his mind, but with the growing ferocity of a child tempted by a crack at acceptance. I know how he feels. It's a high you don't see coming when they first talk to you, but it takes no time at all to realize you would do anything to have it never go away, to stay in the inner circle forever. Making somebody else feel like shit is a very small price to pay, and I bet money that Zach is selling Barney on that right now. Everybody squeezes onto the train after lunch. Andy and I are the only ones not yelling or swinging or dancing around the car. All the adults that were already here have moved to other cars to escape the volume. Andy is on his knees facing the window. He's talking to himself, counting the lights whizzing by. I'm in a two-seater at the very end of the car, keeping my head down. My cheek has started to chill out a little bit, but it still hurts like hell. Every time I look up, Zach and Barney give me the heebies, and Karen is too busy to come to my rescue, so I'm keeping to myself. So far, this year is not shaping up to be what I thought it would. When we pull into West 4th Street, Karen tries to keep us in line, but it's impossible. Kids stream out through the turnstiles, screeching and tumbling over each other. I've fallen behind everyone, and I'm keeping my eyes on the galaxy of gum stains on the ground. As I start on the steps toward the street, I should see it coming, but I don't. A foot juts out from next to me, and I trip, falling onto my face. I see the side of Zach's sneaker bound up past me. My face is on the corner of the concrete step with my swollen cheek on the filthy ground. Then another shoe comes out of nowhere and actually steps on my head. He doesn't put his full weight into it, but enough for the corner to jab into my face and make it feel like it's on fire. I yelp and make a grab at his ankle. He stumbles up the steps past me. I jump to my feet, praying that no one saw what happened. The last thing I want right now is sympathy. I see Barney's chunky butt waddling up to the top of the steps where Zach is waiting for him. The two boys high-five as I spit on the ground. The entire walk back to school, I don't bother counting cracks. I don't care if he falls down the stairs or gets hit by a bus or has a piano fall on them out of the sky, unless it's Zach and Barney. I know that Barney got duped by a scumbag, so I'm not as angry with him, but I want to scalp Zach's rat tail off. My face is swelling and red. I'm angry that my hair isn't long enough to cover the apple forming in my cheek. I don't want any questions and no one asks any. Back at school, I make it up the stairs, through the classroom to my book bag, all the way through Karen's speech and to the end of the day bell without anyone saying anything. Backpack hooked to my belly, chin propped on it, I'm squatting near the door when the bell clangs. I beeline it to the back stairwell and run down a few flights to my secret spot in the gym where I know no one will bother me. It's a person-sized nook between three walls covered in puffy blue padding, a box with one open side, and when I sit on the ground with my back to the wall, I'm essentially invisible. Everyone's spilling into the gym to play or read or get picked up by their parents. I know my mom won't be here for another 25 minutes. I pull my knees into my chest and press the not deformed side of my face into my Jansport, cupping my palm over the tennis ball that has grown under my skin on the other side. Overjoyed to finally be alone, my brain is playing a movie in front of my eyes. The walk to school, the dog shit I almost jumped into when I hopped a hydrant on Bleecker, the half-eaten semolina loaf balled up in my cubby that will be sale by tomorrow, rat tails, salmon-colored t-shirts, the first punch, the overwhelming new burden of someone's hatred. I don't know where to put it all, and I feel a kind of puffed-up deflation. My emotions are wound tight, pushing to the front of my body, ready to explode and yet completely locked away. I want to cry and scream, but nothing is coming out. I don't understand. My mind wanders to Cordelia, the little girl who had something burst in her brain and died on the spot in this gym last year. It was a huge deal. There were posters all over the school. Every mother cried, and she will forever be with this sweet little spirit that everyone remembers fondly. In a morbid corner behind logic, that seems like a desirable outcome to my life. I stay like this for a good half an hour, pretending I don't hear the cacophony around me. Eventually, a clawing feeling comes over me, a sense that I'm trapped in this godforsaken place until my mother comes 
and I'd pull my head upright to search for her, scanning the gym for her distinctive silhouette. At the other end of the gymnasium, dribbling a basketball, I can see Zach making new friends like it's his job. What he lacks in height, he makes up for in personality. Too bad I'm the only person he's decided he hates. Then, like a mirage coming into focus, the wobbling figure of my mother appears. Sweeping through the room like a warrior viking, in a floor-length black trench coat carrying two bulging plastic bags and limping severely, she rises over the sea of little people like a spear moving toward me in a clip. I shift my weight and stand to my feet, swinging my backpack on and pulling my hair in front of the offending side of my face. She strikes me as irritated as she approaches, but I'm trying not to look at her. Let's go, my bud. Her words stop short of telling me what dance class awaits. What is that? Not even 20 seconds have elapsed. She takes my chin in her hand and pulls my face upward, busting the evidence of my inferiority from its cavern of self-pity into the fluorescent glare of impending vengeance. Her eyebrows contract into themselves, and something enters her crystal eyes that reminds me of hot oil. There's an apple in your cheek. A new concept enters my mind, one I can't believe I haven't thought of before. My mother, the all-powerful dragon banshee who has sworn to protect me, is my most valuable weapon. I can win any battle with her on my side. Chin pointed out at a 90 degree angle, I tilt my eyes toward her and I realize what might happen. She speaks through clenched teeth in a voice so calm it unnerves me. Who did this to you? My arm shoots out, pointing toward the basketball court. His name is Zach, he just walked straight up and he punched me in the face, come here, I'll show you. In a flash, I have her hand in mine and I'm pulling her through the gymnasium. Kids move past us in a kind of slow motion like they're hula hooping and jump roping in molasses. I'm high on anticipation. Zach is center court, court when I point him out. He sees me first and flashes a shitty smile that he will regret. Not stopping to put down her omnipresent plastic bag purses, my ma lopes toward him. Standing under her, he barely comes to her ribs, and she looks down into his stunned face and says, Are you Zach? He nods, confused. Dropping her bags on the linoleum floor, Ma grabs him by the shoulders. She presses her hands together and lifts him clear off the ground until his face is level with hers. Terror overwhelms him as he stares at her. She starts to shake him. With every jerk, her speed picks up, and now she's rattling him back and forth like a rag doll, like a maraca. His head snaps back with every word she says through clenched teeth. Don't you ever, ever touch my kid again, not ever, ever. <laughs> I think he's gonna crap his pants. My whole day is turned around. I have never loved my mother more. I'm gasping and hopping at the edge of the court. It flashes through my mind that this is probably very, very illegal and maybe she'd better stop, but I'm not gonna be the one to say anything. <laughs> Everyone in the gym is watching now as she puts him down. Immediately, he starts to cry and runs away. Without breaking her poise, she picks up her plastic back purses and gestures me to follow. I scamper after her like a James Brown song is playing on my spine. We stride down the front steps of the school as giddy as robbers leaving a bank, serious faced and charged up. Not until we hit the corner do I let out a shriek. I leap into the air and high five her. She smiles for a second, then clenches her big hand into a muscular, scary fist and says, Nobody fucks with my butt! <laughs> the next day, <clears throat> Zach keeps his distance. He looks like a wounded puppy. Everybody's hesitant to get too close to me, too. Maybe they fear the thrashing Zach got, but I don't even care. As long as he's not punching anybody, none of it matters. I feel as though I'm part of some secret club with my mom that involves staying away from everyone else because we're dangerous badasses and they all know we mean business. After school, we go into a bathroom on the second floor because it's more secluded. Sitting on a stool by the sink, I'm watching my mom apply lipstick in the mirror. She's wearing her big trench coat again and her plastic bags are on a stainless steel shelf under the mirror. There's an overweight woman in spandex pants and a black t-shirt at the mirror opposite Mom's back. 
we're talking about the audition I'm going on in an hour. It's for something directed by the daughter of somebody famous named Arthur Miller, and it's important. Uh. Suddenly I'm aware that the woman has turned around and is staring at the back of Ma's head. She looks furious, and it takes her a minute to gather her words. She gives me a nasty look, then says to my mom, are you Aya's mother? Without turning around or stopping the application of her lipstick, my ma says, yeah, what about it? <laughs> you assaulted my son yesterday. <laughs> the look on ma's face is one of pure disgust, as though this woman has squirted something rancid into her mouth. Psh, I didn't assault anybody. You have absolutely no right to lay your hands on a child. Little prick. Somebody needs to set him straight. Your freakish child is out of control, attacking my son and then you? If you go ever go and anywhere near my children again, I'm gonna report you to the police. Mm. You have crossed into an invisible no-fly zone, lady. You are now in aggravated enemy territory and you just took your foot off a landmine. Ma looks down at her bags. She sucks her teeth and caps her lipstick. She turns around and, facing this offensive woman, scrapes together everything in her throat and hocks it onto the ground at her feet. Fuck you and your aerobics pants, your fat ass, and your monstrous children. Tell your dickhead son to keep his hands off my kit. <laughs> With that, she gestures toward me and sweeps out the door. I scramble off my stool after her, leaving Zach's mother fuming and cursing in castrated mom speak in the second grader's bathroom. I wish I could say that's how it ends. I wish I could report that Zach Sanders had any sense of self-preservation. The near whiplash incident slowed him down, but only for a bit. Within a month, he was back to top shithead form. Now the morning trip to school feels like a daily plank walk. The confusion about my gender is just too easy. He preys on my vulnerable weirdness. As a result, I'm becoming more introverted. The constant ridicule in front of my classmates is exhausting, and he encourages everyone to be physical in their search for answers. He realized he hit the jugular with a relentless stream of variations on my most dreaded question. What are you? At recess, Zach gathers his posse in the bathroom so I don't have to push past them to go, so I've given up on peeing. It was a stressful process before, but this makes it completely impossible. I've become obsessed with not stepping on the cracks in the sidewalk, and my neurotic suspicious, suspicion games have accelerated to a new level. If I get to the bottom step before the subway comes, Zach will get run over. If I make it to the top step before the door closes behind my neighbor, he'll die. The unvented anger eventually turns inward, eating at me, creating a violent fantasy life that overtakes my thoughts. Charging to school in the dead freeze of winter, I dream of stripping Zach to his underwear and making him run the streets barefoot. Feeling helpless, I sit on my stoop and contemplate stringing him upside down and pouring honey into his nose. I think about how he'd squeal when I stick thumbtacks between his fingers and under his nails. Eat an entire plate of fudge and then puke your guts out, you bullying bastard. I think about making him eat a shit milkshake. That one might have been my ma's idea. She's always defaults to making her enemies ingest feces. Nine steps to the bathroom during morning writing time, four to the stall, nine steps back to the classroom, two steps to my cubby. Mine is in the middle of three rows of wooden squares stacked on top of each other. I'm reaching for my black and white marble notebook when it hits me, a thud and a pain in my left forearm. Smack. I don't know what happened. I look down. There's a pencil sticking out of my flesh. I feel my eyebrows go up. I just look at it, the offending object. What is it doing there? I look up, and Zach is standing in front of me, arms crossed, smiling wide. I'm confused. It takes me a long time to cry out. I only let go and scream when I remember about lead poisoning. Too, so it's hard to tell, but there's a little piece of 
what I found out later is not lead, but it's whatever the fuck fake shit they made pencils out of in the 90s in my arm still from him. So thank you, Zach. It's just not your real name wherever you are. Oh, man, that was a long chapter, guys. Sorry. <laughs> um, does anybody have any thoughts or questions or burning desires to tell me that you relate? We're so proud of you, I. Ah! Listen up, y'all. This is not gonna work like this, where I stand up here and bear my darkest shit to you and then y'all don't say anything back to me. So this is gonna have to be a two-way street. Yeah. I see your mom and you really have her voice down perfectly. I haven't seen you guys in a while. And when you're talking, I'm like, oh, I can tell you that. Oh, my mom, yeah. It's Rebecca, right? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. The audio book, I'm like, in every character, there's like a, an Indian midwife and an Italian friend of my father's and a Brazilian boyfriend, and I do them all. <laughs> it's a doozy. Hi. Hi, uh, did you actually like, cause there's a lot of cursing, was that like, in your own head, like the name, like all like the sarcasm and the names and everything? Oh my God, yeah. That was, I grew up with my mom being like, stop fucking cursing, what the fuck fair, is wrong with you? Very fair, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah. I've been asked this question before. The first two chapters in the book, one is fully before I was born and one is my birth, which is, I guess also before I was born. But uh, people ask how I've written about that stuff and how accurate my memories are from back then. And it's like, I kept journals since I was teeny tiny. Like, since I could scribble, I kept a journal. So I always, uh, I, heard, I heard recently that like, girls' diary and boys' journal. <laughs> Uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, yeah, I've always written my thoughts in some kind of notebook form, and um, that was very helpful, but I also interviewed my family extensively for this process, and it's also always really funny interviewing both my parents, especially about the story of my birth, got me to very similar but distinctly different <laughs> recountings of the same 36 hour period. My dad's like very myopic with certain details, and my mom's all bird's eye view of her 36 hours of agony. It's pretty funny. Truth, right? I mean, like what, you know, you, all of you are gonna leave this room having had a completely different experience, so when writing a memoir, truth is always the question. You know, how true is it? How accurate is it? It's, it's not the truth. There is no truth to an experience that multiple people had. There's my experience of what happened to all of us, and that's what this book is. It's my experience, not the truth. But it's my truth. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? God, you're all so hot. I forgot that everyone in New York is hot. <laughs> Up here. Hi. How are you? Mm. Uh, is there Sweaty. anything? <laughs> Is there anything like when you write a book like this that just made you uncomfortable even to talk about or to, to express yourself? Or is there anything that like, you were worried about like offending people or you know, because you want to be honest but you also are sensitive, especially when you're writing about people you love? Oh my god, yeah, great question. It's it's terrifying. My 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 tactic was to send everybody that's in the book, almost everyone that's in the book, the chapters that involve them, and ask them if they approved. And I asked everyone to pick their own pseudonym. Um, uh, the issue of of recounting things that are painful and difficult for everyone, which I I wanted to read a chapter that was like maybe had a laugh at the end and some triumph, but there are unfortunately very few in this book. It's a pretty heavy, dark. Not in the book, um, but uh, it's dangerous, you know? People don't like to have other people in control of their narrative, and I understand that, and like that's a scary thing to do, and I wanted to be as respectful as possible. I called both my parents when this thing was at first a glimmer and said, hey, are you guys down? And my dad was like, fuck yeah. And my mom was like, I'm 18, kid, you know? So like, they were with me the whole way. My dad edited every single word of nine full drafts of 140,000 words. I mean, this is 108, it was 140. And he edited every single word of the thing the whole way through, so I see you. Um, yeah, there are more, for me, 
because I lived as a boy for eight years and now it's weird every 14 years it switched for me when I was 14 I was like I'm gonna try being a girl and then when I was 28 I was like actually I'm a dude and so now here I stand before you identifying as a man and with boobs um and the danger for me is that people now are really focusing on that and they're really making it a story about gender and I don't want anybody to attach themselves to this as the transgender, like this is what the transgender experience is, because it's not. It's my experience and a lot of people experience it very differently. A lot of people really hate the bodies that they were born in and don't switch back or ever switch or anything and it's like, I don't, I don't want to be taken as a poster child for anything. Um, and I'm also worried, you know, in, in my parents' day, they called anybody who cross-dressed a tranny. So when writing first person present, I use the word tranny a couple times in the book, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna get fucking vilified. And it's like, I know it's not PC, but I was trying to be true to the time, you know, things like that. Sure, yeah, it's terrifying. I mean, you know how you're gonna read this and you're gonna know every detail of how I lost my virginity, you know? Like, that's fucking embarrassing and terrifying. <laughs> But I mean, the, 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 what I've been telling myself all day today as I like walk around New York and have nerves and then joy and then fear and all of the cacophony of things that happen in a moment like today for me um, is that I wrote this book for a reason. I wrote this book for other people so that kids who maybe feel like they are other for whatever reason um, will feel more at home, like they have somebody that's with them, you know? Um, little Io is a very generous hugger, you know? So like, hug him, he's down. Um, and so really also that uh, parents, I've said this since the beginning, and this is the main message that I wanna get across, is that for everything my parents dropped the ball on, which a lot of times it was some, some basic shit, you know, food and electricity were not always guaranteed, and like, Predictability was not guaranteed, and, and uh, the one thing that they got unequivocally right from the first second I was born until this day is that they accepted me for who I said that I was. And that always gave me a sense of dignity and a sense of self-respect that allowed me to survive the world past them. And if people, I want people to rethink what they are prioritizing with their children. So it's not about being LGBT, it's not about being trans, it's not about being gay, it's not about, it's about any horizontal identity that you don't inherit from your family. I want people to reconsider how they address that with their ch children and with their friends, with anybody in their lives. Like, let people tell you who they are, because that carries an incredible value, you know? I'm like, you can buy your kid a Lexus and then you can get him into Harvard, but like, all that shit with the apocalypse, bye! But their sense of self, is what's gonna keep them walking. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. In the back, the pretty boy with the mustache. Where's the um, after party? I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, my, my question is about, you know, Your, your youth was documented a lot with some pretty incredible photographs, and I wonder how much did those photos play a role in recalling these events, or is your memory So awesome? that's a good question. No, my memory sucks. Like, I swear I have a hole in my brain that, like, shit leaks out of my ear. I don't know. Um, no, I... You know, they, they played a role in recounting instances in the book for sure, but what they really played a really intense role in is, my mom had a Minox B spy camera, which is this like little tiny silver thing, and like, it, like everybody has like a sweater or like a fucking dad who wore a fanny pack or like something from their childhood where they're like, ah, mine was this Minox B camera that she had every single second of my life and was always documenting everything from when she got pregnant with me until after I left. And uh, I, I scanned all 2,500 or so of her photos for this book. And actually, what happened was not so much um, remembering things that I didn't remember. It was more that I connected with little me for the first time as an adult. And I had 
shut out little Io completely, and I didn't know that that had happened. And I had also thereby disconnected from my body and what I thought was really going on with it. And when I looked at pictures of me at like two, three years old flexing at the pool, I was like, holy shit, I've been expressing this since I could stand up. Like, I'm a boy and I always have been a boy. And I thought that the way for me to be normal and the way for me to have friends and not be alone all the time was to like curl my hair to my ass and wear mini skirts, and that just was fucking awkward, you know? So this process of scanning her photos actually um, reconnected me with myself that I think to be my truest self, as true as it can be at 31, but um, yeah, being extensively documented gave me an outside perspective on that, and now I'm a boy. <laughs> So thank you guys all for coming into this boy talk.